Greetings to each one of you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a joy to be before you once again with God's word. And so for today's meditation, as we continue on the series looking unto Jesus, let us turn to Luke chapter 6, 12 through 16. Luke chapter 6, 12 through 16. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Let us look to Jesus this morning. Let us pray. Jesus, I pray that you would show us your heart. Show us, O oh Lord, a deeper sense of what you want us to hear this morning, Lord. I pray that the words that I speak would only come from you, Lord. And if there are things I missed, I pray, Lord, that you would, Lord, fill the gaps by the power of your Holy Spirit and speak into every individual heart. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today, um, I would like to cover the topic, Jesus the Pastor. When we read the Gospels, we see Jesus' heart uh, in the way that he interacted with the 12 disciples. He chose these 12 to be his close companions and trainees in the three and a half years of his ministry. So you might ask, why did he choose these 12? Or as Luke says, who also wrote Acts called them apostles. So Jesus being the fulfillment of the Jewish promises for the Messiah, with his arrival, he established the kingdom of God on earth, which again is still advancing today. But in doing that, he stayed pr true to the promises of Abraham and later through his descendants and through Jacob to make their descendants great, that he would, the seed of that promise would come through the lineage of Abraham. And so we know that Jacob had 12 sons and 12 tribes were formed of them. So Jesus picked 12 disciples. We don't know the tribal affiliations of these 12, but at least we know that by picking 12 disciples and not any less or not any more, God is trying to speak to the people of Israel that his ways are still continuing and his promises are still being fulfilled and these 12 from, were from all walks of life. We have heard messages on this. Many of them were fishermen. There were also a couple of people on two, uh, two different sides of the political spectrum. You had a, a fisherman in Matthew. Oh, sorry, a, a tax collector in Matthew. Tax collectors those days cooperated with the Roman government to essentially cheat their own people. They were traitors. They were seen as sinful for cheating people out of money because they took the extra out of the taxes for themselves. And then on the other hand, you have Simon, who is known as a zealot. Who the, the zealots were those who were the revolutionaries. They wanted to overthrow Roman control and Roman government. So imagine these two people in two different spectrums in the political sphere in this 12. But at the call of Jesus, each one of these 12 dropped everything to follow him. There was an effectual call for each one of these 12. And many, and God willing, we may go into those stories. Those stories itself are individual messages themselves. To understand the ways of God and how God builds stories through people. Every, every apostle's story is not the same. God in, in unique ways called out each one of the 12. 
And, they, and, and the call of Jesus made such a strong impact in them that in a split second, they dropped everything to follow him. Seeing the differences in, in these 12, I mean, there's no reason to believe that they saw eye to eye on anything. We know this. If you just read through the Gospels, you see that they constantly were in a battle against who was the best. To make things seemingly worse, in, in human eyes, Jesus picked Judas. Fully knowing what, Jesus, what Judas was going to do at the end. It was not an accident. It was, Jesus was not shocked. We know from the accounts of Gospels from the beginning onwards, Jesus clearly says, and in the Gospels clearly say that Judas was a traitor, was a betrayer. Jesus even called that one among you is Satan. But the, the purpose why Jesus chose Judas, of course, one is that Judas was, or Jesus was following the will of his father. And also, secondly, Jesus was following Scripture. In order for Scripture to be fulfilled, Jesus picked Judas. So when we go back to that passage I read, what stands out from this passage that we read in Luke 6 is that Jesus went to the mountain to pray. And he prayed continually through the night to God before choosing his disciples. We need to pause there and, and, and think about this. He continually prayed in that mountain all night for this choice to be made. You know, many times when we make choices in our life, especially life-altering choices in our life, we make it in a, in a spur of the moment. We don't give it a, a moment's notice even. We don't talk to people about it. We don't even consult God. We are convinced that this is the way to go. I'm just going to make the decision. And without even a, a, a effort to seek the presence of God, to wait in the presence of God, we make decisions haste, hastily. And so this is a reminder for us, and Jesus is showing us an example as to if Jesus had to pray, if Jesus had to pray all night for this, how much more do we need to consider the decisions that we make in our life with a burden and with, with a kind of slowness of heart? You say, Lord, I'm going to wait in your presence I am not going to say yes or no. I'm going to wait and not, be ha my, not make any haste decisions in my life. If you took all night to pray, you being God in, in flesh, and praying to the Father and seeking His will, I want to do the same, Lord. Amen. So why did Jesus pray? What do you, why do you think Jesus prayed? You know, I was trying to imagine what the prayers of Jesus would be like in that moment. Um, one, one thing that led my mind to was the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Maybe the prayers of Jesus was very similar to that. So if we turn to John chapter four, 17, John chapter 17, I'm just going to pick some verses between 1 and 12. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to whom you have given him. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you, whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. While I was with them, I kept them in your name which you have given me, I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. There's so many other verses I want to highlight, but I'm cutting short because of the time. So if we look at this final prayer that Jesus had, maybe not the final, but at least in scripture that we see accounted, recounted by the disciple John, this high priestly prayer gives us a window into the prayer life of Jesus, his communion with the Father. And look at the things that Jesus is praying here. It must have been very similar to that first prayer that he prayed in the mountain before choosing the, the disciples. 
Jesus may, may have prayed, Father, reveal to them, reveal to me those you have chosen for me. Father, they are yours. All I have is yours. Father, reveal to them who I am. Reveal your wisdom to these little ones that I'm about to choose. Father, guard them in your word. Keep them from the evil one. Father, make them one just as you and I are one. Just imagine Jesus praying over and over these things over the, the 12 that he was about to choose. A very pivotal decision in Jesus' ministry and life. So uh, we read that passage, Jesus chose the 12, and then from then on out, he began to faithfully shepherd these 12. Now, when we, our, our, theme, our, our series is about looking unto Jesus, so let us take a moment, just look to Jesus in these passages, and, and to look to Jesus as, Jesus as the pastor. Jesus as pastor. Imagine God in flesh, walking in the regions of Judea, walking in the regions of Galilee and surrounding areas with this group of 12 uneducated, ordinary, smelly, dirty disciples. They have no privilege to say anything about them. And if it was today, if one of us were in that position like Jesus was, we would search out the best and the brightest, right? Because that's just the way that we have been programmed to think. Find the best looking, the tallest, the, the, the most articulate, educated, privileged people that can walk in a cultured way. But Jesus did actually the opposite. Amen. Hallelujah. There are three things that when we look at Jesus that we can see through the gospel accounts. When Jesus looked at these disciples... Knowing their slowness to learn, Jesus still taught, taught them. Knowing their slowness to learn, Jesus still taught them. There are several instances that, uh, that if I were to bring it all up, time will run really quickly. We know in different ways that Jesus taught these disciples. Taught them the mysteries of the kingdom through parables. The general audience heard the parables and they maybe got a moral story out of it. Maybe some, some of them got a revelation. But Jesus specifically put, took the disciples aside and explained to them the parables. What was this all about? You know, with the closeness, with anyone comes the frustrations, right? So Jesus, we see, and the, and the gospel writers are so open to write down all the different ways Jesus was frustrated with his disciples. But not in a sinful way, as we know. Jesus was sinless. But frustrations are, are normal, as long as you don't sin. We know that Jesus several times talked about their slowness to learn. After feeding the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water, then now they're in front of a crowd of 4,000, and they're asking, how do we feed these people? And, and the gospel writer says that their hearts were hardened, that they didn't understand what was going on. They didn't understand who was in their midst. So Jesus, again, patiently asked, How, what do you have in your hand? He multiplied it again. This is, the, this is how Jesus interacted with the disciples. After uh, the transfiguration, which is the, the height of the moment uh, you know, that we all believe, that, that Jesus was glorified. In front of the three, his closest three, when he came down the mountain, he comes across the disciples who say, we could not cast out this demon out of this, this uh, child. And Jesus, and again, in frustration said, oh, faithless and, and twisted generation, how long am I going to be with you? But in here we see the pastoral nature of Jesus. I think of Jesus who, after his resurrection, he almost did a repeat of all the lessons taught over the last three and a half years. If you did not understand what everything I said before, 
I'm going to teach you again. In the 40 days, there was like a review course. Not only that, he prayed to the Father to send the Holy Spirit who will teach them once again. This is the pastoral nature of Jesus to teach not just the disciples, but everyone who would follow after when the disciples preached the word of God into the nations, Jesus has a commitment to each one of us to, to teach us. And, to, and, and I'll go into that a little bit more. How today Jesus teaches us, us. Since time is flying, let me quickly move forward. Secondly, knowing their fickleness or their inconsistency, Jesus still loved them. Jesus knew from the, from the beginning that these disciples that he is training up and taking along with him, when he, and at the crucial moment, all of them will scatter. Jesus said that the shepherd will be struck and the, and the sheep will scatter. This is, again, he knew it because it was a, ful- it was a fulfillment of Scripture. If you knew somebody in your life was about to, to, to not, 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 not betray you, but just distance from you a few years from now, would you invest in that person, your time, your trust, your commitment? I would say most likely the answer is no. But Jesus still loved them. Even in the fickleness of their heart. Jesus loved Judas. Although he knew who Judas was, he washed Judas' feet. When Judas came to give, betray him with a kiss, that's a very, very close, uh, it's an indication of closeness, right? Judas said, I am whoever I kiss on the cheek, that's, uh, that's Jesus. So he betrayed Jesus with a kiss. And what did Jesus say? Friend, why have you come? Did Jesus know what was happening? Of course. But it's like God coming down the cool of the day when Adam and Eve had sinned against uh, God and, and God saying, Adam, where are you? Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. In John 13, we hear, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. In Jesus' pastoral heart, he loved his disciples. Number three, Jesus, knowing their weakness, still empowered them. Jesus sent the 12, and then actually a total of 70 or 72, based on the manuscripts you read. They sent them into villages, and he gave them authority to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, and, 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 and cast out demons and all of that. Jesus was training them, empowering them in their weakness to do, and, and as a training method to do his ministry. We know after his resurrection, these fearful disciples held up in a house. Jesus appears in the midst, and he breathes on them, says, do not be afraid. Receive the Holy Spirit. And we know this, that Jesus ultimately commanded them to wait in Jerusalem until they were clothed with power on high, to become witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. These weak disciples were empowered by Pastor Jesus. Hallelujah. So what does this mean for us today? Let me read a couple of passages of scripture that we are familiar with. And Pastor Shibu actually gave a message on this a couple of years ago. So if you want to listen to that as well, it would be very helpful. 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 through 4. So I exhort you, the elders among you, as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more passage, and I will explain. Paul says this to the Ephesian elders. Acts chapter 20, 28 to 32. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you 
overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among yourselves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. And give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So from these two passages, let me let me bring up three more points and I will sit down. Jesus, the chief shepherd of the flock, purchased us with his own blood. There's a sacred responsibility for those who are appointed and will be appointed for the service. Shepherds are to steward the flock, which are obtained by the blood of Jesus. God's blood was shed for the flock. So here the exhortation is, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. This flock was purchased by Jesus. The sacred responsibility of the flock has been given in the hands of the shepherds and the precious blood of Christ What's the purchasing value for that? So those of you who shepherd and teach and serve in any capacity in the church of God, we need to realize if we mess with the flock of God, we mess with Jesus. If we feed false teachings to the flock, strict punishment awaits for those who mislead the flock of God that was purchased by his blood. If you mistreat his sheep and you do not repent, await fearful judgment from the chief shepherd. Secondly, Jesus, the chief shepherd of the flock, appointed under under shepherds. This term is not common, but it it gives gives us explanation as to what are the roles of shepherds today. We are under shepherds of the chief shepherd, those who are shepherds not me to tend for us these these under shepherds to tend for us protect us from wolves and to be examples for us i think this is the one point i hope i can just emphasize is that do we often forget that the shepherds and the pastors appointed to, to us are not by accident The shepherds appointed to us are appointed by Jesus. Do you believe that? If that is the case, if Jesus has appointed the shepherd over you, how would it be any how would would we be any different in how you see the role of the shepherd in your life? How we treat our local shepherds. Show how much we love Jesus, the chief shepherd. Jesus said this in a different context, but I'm going to apply it to this as well. Whatever you have done to the least of my brothers, you have done unto me. So wouldn't that be the case for those who have, uh, have put their life aside to feed us and to shepherd us in the faith? Third point, Jesus, the chief shepherd of the flock, will appear again to give rewards to the faithful shepherds. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Not everyone is called to be a shepherd or a pastor, but it is a glorious call. It is a heavy call. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, this, worthy, this saying is trustworthy. This is a common saying in that day. If anyone aspires to, be in the, to, aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. That word overseer is another word for elder or pastor. 
So the desire to be a pastor is not a sinful desire. It's not a desire out of ambition. It's actually a noble desire. But before we think that we are supposed to jump into this, there are some high standards to meet. First of all, we read in First, uh, first Peter chapter 5 that these shepherds should not be shepherds under compulsion, but they have to do it willingly. Not for shameful gain, but do it eagerly. So that call for being a shepherd cannot be forced upon you. It has to be free from all compulsions, whether it's earthly gain, societal pressure, reputation, the, the, the feeling to feel powerful and significant. This is a call for suffering. It's a call to follow the, path for the, the footpaths of Jesus. I'll read quickly the qualifications and then I will sit down. First Timothy. Not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil." We're seeing the ramifications of wrong shepherds being chosen, right? It's bringing great shame into the body of Christ. Hidden sins that were existing decades and decades ago coming to the light. And so this is not an easy call. But at the same time, I'm speaking to my younger, uh, my younger audience here. If the Lord puts a call in your heart for pastoral ministry. It is a noble call. We don't do it out of gain. We don't do it out of selfishness. Pray like Jesus prayed. One thing that I'm, I, you know, that I want to share a couple of things. One, one testimony is understanding in the, light, in, the, in the light of this church, there was a time where I was, this is many years ago, I was frustrated. I, I, you know, as many of my friends were leaving the church, I thought I should leave as well. And in a uh, all night, uh, in a uh, watch night service, uh, Pastor Shibu Thomas was up front. He called up Pastor John Wargis to be in his side. And I don't know what it was, but I saw God's grace upon both of those men. And... Uh, I thought a, a voice came to my heart. This is home. We need to stay. And um, so I honor the men of God in our midst. Not just our two pastors who have shepherded us, but the associate pastors in our congregation. All the different ministers and uh, they're doing many different things for the Lord, both in secret and in public. I honor each one of you for pitching in this task. I know one thing if for all, any one of us who desire this is. Don't say, I will, with a closed fist, and don't say, I won't, with a closed fist. If you are in a season where you're praying and seeking the Lord, come with an open hand and say, Lord, here I am before you, my life completely before you. Take me through a journey, Lord, where I learn that I am, I am, I am tested and tried, Lord, by the forces of, not just by the force of darkness, but by people, Lord. By the difficulties that, that we see Jesus face with the disciples. So I'm going to uh, spend a moment of time just praying for us all as a congregation. Let us lift our voices to the Lord and let us pray for the Lord will, Lord, Lord will, the Lord of the harvest will send laborers to his vineyard. It's not just in this church, but this, uh, this state, this, this nation, the, our, our home country in India needs shepherds. And so let us pray to the Lord of the harvest. Lord, we pray, O oh Lord. 
this moment, O oh Lord, that you will raise up, O oh Lord, servants, O oh Lord, to be shepherds, O oh Lord God. To know that know the value of the flock, Lord. To know that they have been, Lord, they have been given a huge responsibility to be, Lord, the caretakers of this flock, Lord God. I pray, O oh Lord, that they would guard this flock in the word, guard their flock in truth, O oh Lord. I pray that you anoint them by the power of the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord. We lift up the shepherds in this church, especially Pastor Shibu and his family, Lord, and Pastor John Wargis, Lord, all the different uh, associate ministers and pastors of this church, Lord. We pray for a special unction of your Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, in this moment. Lord, help them to experience a, a new uh, Lord, a new power, O oh Lord, new revelation in your word, O oh Lord. Help them to feel the peace of God that passes all understanding as they minister in our midst. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we will look unto you, Jesus, as our model, Lord. You are the chief shepherd, O oh Lord God. And that, Lord, as a chief shepherd, we pray, O oh Lord, that you appoint under shepherds, O oh Lord, to your church, O oh Lord God, so that the church may be built up in in the full knowledge of Christ, we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.